to have a new meaning for for the world would be to to question all of the purposes and meanings and goals that that one has had for the world and and gets back to our uses of the body and so on and so forth to help to ask the Holy Spirit to help sort out in the mind the true from the false and then to to lay aside the false and this is where the resurrection comes in a final decision a final letting go of all other strivings and purposes and desires and just having a desire only for the Father so the resurrection of Jesus preceded what we think of as his physical resurrection yeah, is that right? Well, if you if you take it back to a time sense, um, yes, th that he says that the resurrection is the acceptance of the atonement for oneself. So this is a decision that's made in the mind. And as we've just read, the body functions perfectly after that decision. In other words, once the decision is made, then the body is simply a vehicle or a manifestation to be used by the Holy Spirit to let the light shine into the world, so to speak, or let the, the Spirit be demonstrated, be manifested to, to the world. And so in that sense, um, you know, the atonement is a decision, and um, it appears to be a decision Jesus made um, before the, the crucifixion that the crucifixion and drama and the, the resurrection drama were all part of a, like a playing out or a teaching example that was to be left uh, for the world to see. Now, of course, you know, we're, we're still speaking in metaphors because whenever you ask a question about the past, you know, about when Jesus accepted the atonement or so on and so forth, we're still obviously in metaphors because what the Course is telling us is that this is the decision that, that I must make. This is the decision that the, the student of the Course must make, the teacher of God must make. And as we go deeper into the Course, we find that there is only one time that the atonement can be accepted, and that's now. So we, it takes us out of the context of a linear sense of trying to say, now when did Jesus, you know, the, the ego will go on with questions of, what point in his life did Jesus accept it? And all kinds of fascinating, ingenious questions, you know. But they're all, at subtle levels, still distractions away from the, the central point Jesus makes is that the, the teacher of God, the student of the Course, has to accept that decision for the atonement for himself. That's the sole responsibility of the miracle worker and the teacher of God. The next question oftentimes, you know, is like, okay, having heard that, then, you know, how do I do that? Or what do I do? That's a very common question. And once again, you know, he, we have A Course in Miracles. We have a tool for awakening, a curriculum, if you will, to follow. It has a text, it has a workbook or a lab, and it has a teacher's manual. This is something that is to be applied, not just read or talked about when he gives instructions in the workbook to do certain things, to try to remember this thought so many times a day, um, or to apply this thought to particular things in the room or out the window or so on and so forth. This is a training program for the mind. This is a very practical training program that's been given to the deceived mind to be used to wake up, to make that final decision for the atonement. And the resistance, is, as anyone who's, who's attempted to, to work with the Course, the resistance is, is experienced um, because the mind is still split between the ego and the Holy Spirit, and, and the ego is very, very resistant to, um, to learning this Course, to applying this course because literally this course when applied is the undoing of the ego
that's where the mind watching comes in that you talk about. Um, do you want to go into that a little bit? Yeah. Uh, after one's worked with the course for a while and uh, particularly gets into the workbook, um, there are a number of passages in the workbook that talk about searching the mind, um, watching the thoughts go by as dispassionately as possible. At one point, as if you were watching an, like an oddly sorted, like a parade going by, or different metaphors for watching the thoughts, being able to step back a bit and watch them dispassionately. And if we look at even the Bible, there are a number of parables about, for instance, the, the ten virgins. Um, you know, five with the oil for their um, lamps, and five the foolish ones that, that didn't bring oil, and that uh, in the parable that missed the bridegroom because they weren't prepared. The preparation in that particular parable, as well as some of the other ones in the Bible, and the, and the emphasis on watch, keep watch, kind of translates in the Course to watch your mind. You must always keep watch of your mind. Be vigilant only for God and His kingdom. You know, the, the sense of, of, you know, at one point Jesus saying you're much too tolerant of mind wandering, that, that the mind has to be trained to be attentive to the thoughts. And once again, what we see is that there are two thought systems in the mind, in the sense the Holy Spirit's thought system, which is referred to as, he calls them, your real thoughts. And then um, the ego's thought system, which is a fear-based thought system, which is referred to, the thoughts are referred to as unreal. Um, at other points they're referred to as attack thoughts. Um, so basically, the mind has to um, sort out, has to discern between these two thought systems, relinquish the fear-based thought system, and then um, what's left is are the real thoughts in the mind. The light that's in the mind has been covered over by the cloud banks of, uh, of attack thoughts. And the untrained mind basically is just full of unreal thoughts. Yes. The mind is blank, as one of the lessons says. Yes. When, when the mind is is um, invested in these thoughts and believes that they are real thoughts, though they are unreal attack thoughts and did not come from God, then literally the mind thinks that it's thinking real thoughts. I mean, it thinks it's in a real world because these thoughts are projected and, and show up, so to speak, on the screen as a world. And and there seems to be an inner world and an outer world. For instance, um, boy, one can say, I'm, I'm glad I didn't say what I was thinking there, but as if there's saying or behavior or, or what's on the world is one thing, and thinking is another. And the workbook is a, is a sense of training the mind to see that, that the thoughts that you think you think are not real. And in the ultimate sense, you know, you think you're thinking, but your mind is literally blank when it's preoccupied with these attack thoughts, which include thoughts of the past and thoughts of the future. So any thinking that has a component of form is not thinking at all. Well, is that right? I think it might be a better distinction to say that, to use our dis time distinction, that any thought uh, of constructed about the past or the future um, is, is not thinking. I, the, real, the real thoughts, um, I feel, are a metaphor um, for the miracle or true perception. And once again, true perception still involves form. Okay, because it's still perception. But all meaning uh, of past tense and a future tense you know, have, has been removed from it. So in other words, it's like a, a kind of a blank slate. But um, there isn't meaning being read into the, to the form except for the Holy Spirit's one purpose, which then is frees the mind, and that's the real world. So, well, again, we're getting into subtle points, but we can say that the attack thoughts are rep represent distorted perception. 
that once these thoughts have been questioned, that once the mind has been able to disidentify or dispassionately watch these thoughts and see them as merely false without investing in them and believing in them, then we get down to the real thoughts, which are representative of the real world or true perception or healed mind. And do the unreal thoughts diminish as that occurs? Well, in a, in a sense, diminish still brings it more to like a quantifiable thing, where I think the, the best way of coming at it is what Jesus says, they will fade. It's like they fade. They become more distant. They become more and more peripheral and less noticed as attention is withdrawn from them, as, as in a, getting away with a sense of, of diminishing or um, more or less, diminishing or, 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 mm -hmm. or quantifiable. They just fade and fade and fade. So that the attention of the mind is given to the real thought yes. instead. Yes. Which, which is automatic once the, once the mind, you know, keeps focused on the the atonement and literally protects the mind with the atonement. It literally, the atonement, um, one cannot have attention on the atonement and on those thoughts as well. It's one of those decisions, an either or decision. So when the mind becomes very good at consistently um, choosing the miracle, keeping keeping its attention on the, the atonement, um, then the the thoughts the other thoughts begin to fade because they aren't the attention and investment has been withdrawn from the attack thoughts. And in the ultimate sense we can speak of thought with a capital T as being Christ. In other words, that Jesus describes Christ as a thought or an idea in the mind of God. And you notice how that is it's capital T and it's singular. Singular is very important here. Because even mm -hmm. real thought still has a plural sense and, and still gives us the sense of um, there's still a bit of perception involved in that. Even though it's healed, even though it's the impurities or the the wheat and the chaff have been separated out, so to speak, and we just have the grain, the fruit of the grain, the real thoughts, that the thought of God, Christ, is literally beyond perception. You know, the Christ and Father are are part of the kingdom of heaven and part of what the state of knowledge with the capital K, which again is is just is. It's, it does not involve form in any way. So go back to the mind watching a little bit in terms of, I guess, how to do that, practical application. Um, just bring it down into the everyday a little bit more if you can. Okay. At the beginning, um, the early lessons really work at uh, first helping the mind tempting the mind to see that, that there really is no difference between the inner and the outer, which is a very fundamental um, principle, a fundamental idea in the Course, in the undoing of the false. And even if we look at the early lessons in terms of uh, the way they're arranged in form, I mean, um, the, the first lesson starts out, nothing I see means anything. Uh, Nothing I see. We're, we're right away. We're, it's a lesson talking about perception mm -hmm. and objects that are that seem to be in the room and so on and so forth. It's followed by a lesson I have given everything I see, all the meaning that it has for me. I mean, it brings it back to a sense of the mind. I have given the mind reading it in, and and these thoughts in the workbook go back and forth um, from the inner and the outer. Focus on. Um, we should say thinking versus perceiving. I number five. I am never upset for the reason I think. Okay, here we're talking about upset, upset, but we're also talking tied into thoughts. I'm never upset for the reason I think. Followed by, um, I'm upset because I see something that is not there. Well, here comes the perception back in. So if you look at at the a lot of the early lessons. He, he goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth between thinking and the mind and and perceiving. 
which is seen.